Hi, everybody. Welcome to FT Insights. I'm Mike Flybus. Today, we're very fortunate to have Dr. James Malt with us. He's Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer at Qualcomm Life. He's also an executive board member at CTA, at CTA and uh, the CTA's Health and Fitness Technology Board Director. So, Jim, let's start there. I know uh, the CTA recently released a report saying that there will be critical mass by 2020 of patient-generated data from wearables. It seems to me that's a little aggressive. How do you see us getting from here to there? Well, I think there's there's clearly a uh, uh, a groundswell of of new devices, sensors, um, and the corresponding data uh, coming from all of these uh, devices and wearables. Uh, what we're doing right now is 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 trying to help the industry and and all of uh, our membership. Uh, come together in in uh, a number of initiatives. One is uh, on the uh, establishing standards uh, for things like uh, sleep measurement, for things even like measurements of steps. You know, we've had a lot of wearables over the over the past five years uh, come to the market, and and now that the data coming from these devices is being uh, contemplated in the the care of of patient um, patients who have health conditions you know, beyond the sports and fitness applications. Uh, there's a need for what we've been talking about as as more of a medical grade uh, concern, and that starts with uh, making sure that that. Uh, a step has a consistent uh, unit of measure and, and how that's uh, rendered. Same thing with heart rate, same thing with blood pressure. Um, and when you start to um, use this information uh, as a physician, as a pharmacist, as a nurse, uh, coming from patient-generated data, uh, it's very important to to have this uniformity. Um, the Health and Fitness Technology Board is is taking that on, and the membership is is I think very committed to these types of uh, kind of next next level concerns. Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. So you know, you mentioned two types of data. Well, to start anyway, you mentioned sleep data and steps, and those are are very different. I imagine. You know, if in 2020, we're probably far more likely to see steps as a reaching critical mass as opposed to sleep metrics. Or am I wrong? No, I I, I, I agree. Yeah, um, you know, I think we're we're trying to figure out what to do with this information. Um, it's one thing to just send raw data to your doctor, um, but the work that has to happen now is, is what does it mean? Um, you know, what are the implications? What are the, the correlates uh, of, of steps and activity to, to health and wellness and disease? And, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's the technology, and frankly, the technology right now is ahead of clinical medicine and the ability for 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 medical science to to know how to use this new uh, type of information. So it's going to take some time. Yeah, definitely. And and so the I mean, when you say the technology, I think the hardware is probably in place or coming in place. The AI is, uh, you know, it, it, to make that data useful is really where we need to catch up. Oh, no question. You know, I, I'm, I'm coining the phrase, uh, you know, or maybe I should trademark it, but we, we've got to move from widgets to digits. And, and the real value is not even in the digits themselves, um, 
but in the as you suggested uh, there's a lot of catchphrases there's artificial intelligence there's machine learning there's predictive analytics uh the bottom line is we have to have the the science and the clinical what are called correlates the correlation between this new data and and how it changes our treatments how it changes our uh, ultimately our outcomes um because that's that's really the only thing that's going to matter is does the introduction of of wearables and and you know this new generation of patient reported data how does that change the way we're taking care of people and and the outcomes that we're getting from our our treatments and our medications and our healthcare expenditures yeah expenditures in particular i mean we're watching the seemingly never ending debate on uh, on healthcare reform <laughs> but I, i think if it's ever going to kind of come into uh some sort of equilibrium there's going to have to be some responsibility on the part of patients in the sense i mean that is what united healthcare is doing you're, you're with the uh, you know the fit program that of course we clock on life is a big partner in but uh, if you're willing to do some certain things for your health then you'll be compensated well there's no debate uh you know we we don't have uh uh unlimited resources uh to pay for uh healthcare here in the United States or anywhere in the world for that matter uh so introducing new technology uh including wearables at some point has to justify the cost by showing some corresponding benefit and and you know it really is an alignment as you talked about uh, our our payment system is starting to move away from fee for service to to value based programs uh whether that's bundled payments or accountable care organizations uh but but the fact of the matter is the the risk bearing entity whether that's the government and our taxpayers whether it's the employers and the insurance companies uh they're very much focused on on what is the 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 intersection between the cost of some new therapy or some new technology and the you know the outcome benefit and you you named it the united healthcare and this uh motion program is one of the a uh, clear starting points for a a large commercial insurance company uh, embedding the use of a of a wearable technology into the actual uh design of of a health plan and and uh, uh it's very much uh a pioneering effort and you're going to start to see a number of these uh blossom over the coming uh few years yeah united healthcare looks like they're really paving the way with this motion fit program it's kind of exciting are you seeing some interest uh, elsewhere in the in the payer community Oh, uh, absolutely. Uh you know, it it uh I think <clears throat> it goes without saying that that it has a number of very attractive elements. Um it's it's literally got an economic model and a and a formula that that sets up kind of the the you know a a a three way uh winning uh scenario that uh, you know for the employer who is paying the bills uh it 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 drives and motivates um uh, you know 
healthy behaviors. Uh, obviously, for the insurance company, um, they're getting uh, not only some interesting data, but they're seeing an improvement in, in healthcare costs. I mean, that's the whole point of this. And on the employee side, uh, you know, show me anywhere uh, where you can get paid uh, to, to perform activities and exercise, not some token little amount of money, but uh, up to $1,500 a year for yourself and another 1500 for your spouse. So you're talking about $3,000 of earning potential and that's very motivating and what you also see is is the retention rate you know once you set up a program like that it's not easy to take that away from the employees so that's good business for united healthcare because it's 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 a solid kind of motivator for for the insurance for the employer to to sign up for that insurance plan again next year. So I, I think you're going to see the industry uh, moving very quickly to this type of model. And, and again, it's a, it's, it's a win, win, win for everybody. Yeah. I haven't really thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. Changing the retention rate. It's good for business uh, for United in, in several ways. Yeah. Yeah. For now, and well, uh, until the other insurance companies have something as as uh, uh, attractive to to offer, right? So, uh, catch us up with the United program. So far, they've added the Fitbit uh, Charge Two. Are there other devices coming down the pike? Most definitely. I mean, I I, I uh, apologize. I can't make any. Uh, any announcements at the moment, but there's uh, in very close succession uh, a, a number of other devices will be announced that will be eligible for the program. The intention is to, you know, as Qualcomm Life, our our mantra is is an open ecosystem. Uh, that was one of the appealing aspects. For United in working with us, you know, our our uh, TuneNet infrastructure is not just iOS; it's also Android, and it's not just Fitbit. But we have, uh, as is public already, we have everybody from Garmin to Fitbit to to Philips and and Strive. All of those operating on the on the TuneNet ecosystem, so that makes it very attractive for United Healthcare to to be able to to work with one entity, Qualcomm Life, and enable uh, the, you know a, an open ecosystem of devices, which creates better choice and and you know a fuller uh, set of options for for the employees because a lot of you know, employees, you know, no employee group has the same smartphone uh, or, or even operating system. And if you're just with, with, you know, an iPhone or with a Samsung Galaxy, that, that just wouldn't work for an insurance company. It, it, you know, you really need to have, uh, you know, a, a lot of choice, a lot of uh, options that you present to employees. And then that gives, you know, increases the likelihood of participation, doesn't it? Yeah, most definitely. And, and I know that United has recognized that fact. They're, they're, they want to limit the barriers. So, you know, everybody has different tastes for what's on their wrists. So let them do whatever they want. And they're yeah. far more likely to participate. As long as the, the measurement of of the device is consistent. Isn't that interesting now? Because if, if the measurement of a, you know, if your bonus is based on how many steps you walked, it, you know, if the Fitbit step measurement is different than, 
the stride step measurement, you know, United Healthcare could, could, and the employer group could be paying out too much money, or they may not be paying out enough money if the step measurement is inconsistent. And see, now you're starting to understand why it's going to become so important that the data coming from these devices has expectations of accuracy and consistency. Uh, you know, and, and steps are one thing, you know, then you start talking about heart rate and blood pressure and, and you know, as a doctor, we might be making life and death decisions on some of this data we got to know that it's accurate. Yeah, no question. And speaking of healthcare, it looks like the momentum for TuneNet is continuing in that space. You just had the life scan announcement and uh, also the Forexel. Um, so tell us more about what's happening, you know, for remote patient monitoring and care. Well, I think you're, you're seeing this movement uh, and remote patient monitoring is undeniably uh, in its, in its uh, breakout growth phase, um, we're pleased to have uh, a, a very diverse and, uh, and, and broad ecosystem uh, now with the announcement of, of J&J and, and Philips and Omron, as you know, uh, you know pretty much all the, the, the who's who in, in, in this space. The, again, it comes back to the, to a couple of things, and and there's a lot of room for uh, excitement now. Uh, the the proposed fee for service schedule, the physician fee for service schedule, that was published last month, is now uh, uh, proposing new CPT codes for remote patient monitoring. That's that's in and of itself a big breakthrough. Uh, we know telehealth is something that that has been uh, has been recognized, uh, you know, for essentially webcam visits uh, for remote face to face video. But remote patient monitoring is is now starting to be understood better, and you know the ability for doctors and nurses and health systems to get paid for remote patient monitoring, uh, even in what's called the, the uh, CCM, chronic care management uh, reimbursement. We were happy that remote patient monitoring could be included as part of the, uh, the services rendered uh, under that code. So, uh, you know, it's, it's building. Uh, I don't, think by any means we're again at a, at a, at a critical mass level. Um, the technology is here and I think the technology is, is just like in the wearables, the technology is leading uh, the ability for clinicians to make use of the information. So, so the, 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 the work that's, that, needs to be accomplished right now is is how do clinicians take in a thousand blood pressure measurements a day and that all comes back to the artificial intelligence the machine learning the predictive analytics and that's why there's so much activity in that space right now i think even more so uh, when you look at the the venture investments uh, there's more venture money pouring into uh, the artificial intelligence and analytics space um, because I think that's that's where the the next immediate opportunity is. Yeah, definitely. Because as you said, you don't want a thousand measurements a day. You want to hear when something is awry or you know if there's a pattern change. That's those are the kinds of things you want to be alerted to. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So one last question, Jim. What can't you believe I didn't ask? Well, I, I think one of the, the other dimensions right now, I'm, I'm sure you want to go there, uh, is interoperability and, and the ability for 
the data to to be liberated uh, and you know, all of this artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, machine learning, uh, none of that's really going to uh, have value and, and ultimately uh, you know, improve outcomes if, if these systems aren't able to easily access the, the data from, uh, from the electronic medical record systems. Um, and I, you know, I think we need to keep pressing uh, very hard for, for, um, uh, for the accessibility to, to this data. I think, I think we're still seeing um, some, some uh, behaviors that are, that are creating uh, toll, toll gates uh, for, for each piece of data that you might want to be able to uh, you know, access. Um, and I think you're going to see, um, I mean, we don't, we don't want it to come to this, but, but it, if it still continues to be hard to get access uh, to the data, and it's not a technology, uh, you know, uh, challenge. I mean, the, the, this, this is clear. There, there's no technology barrier. It's simply the will to cooperate, and and I think there's a lot of of, of uh, white papers and and positions uh, out there now saying, you know, trying to to hold the data hostage and and uh, monetize. The data for the sake of of uh, you know pure you know revenue generation is I think that's going to be a uh, how shall we call it a a, uh, a, a, a an old model that that uh, doesn't uh, support modern times or or doing the right thing. Yeah, that makes total sense. Sort of a, a plea for health net neutrality, I guess, or, or to net neutrality in your case. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to work together, um, but it, it, it will hopefully take care of itself in a number of ways because these are going to become patient safety issues. Um, now that we have predictive algorithms, that can watch the streaming data and combine it with other data sets and potentially reduce, you know, hospital length of stay, you know, by, by 15, 20%. Um, health systems and payers are, are going to be demanding uh, that, that they have access uh, to the data that that are are necessary to feed these uh, these AI systems. Right, and I, I've seen a few healthcare exchanges pop up here and there, uh, but um, but yeah, there are many obstacles in the way, as you say. Yeah, yeah. Jim, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This was this was great. Absolutely, Mike. I was happy to, to have the conversation. Likewise. Thanks to you for watching. Until next time, bye-bye.